Andre Carpathy, the former direct AI director at Tesla who helped build Autopilot and also one of the original founders of OpenAI, dropped a talk at Y Combinator last week. And it's really an, it's been an interesting talk and been very polarizing. So let's dive into this today and dig into what Carpathy says, where I think he's spot on, where I think he's just still a little visionary and what I think we can do about it today. Let's dive in. Now, this is where I totally agree with Carpathy, right? And I and I really loved this analogy and I've used it a handful of times since then. What we need to be doing is getting into augmentation and you know, and to build agents. Tony Stark did not build robots to go and do the work for him. He built a suit that would come, that would, you know, strap onto him, and then Jarvis would feed him and give him superhuman powers to then be able to go and to do amazing things. This is what we get, what we can do. The only difference is, is that if the suit were to say, he were to say go left and it thinks, well, no, I actually think you mean like up and to the left. Like this is that Rain Man and that jagged intelligence that I think is what becomes dangerous is I think we can't underestimate how far we still are, you know, from these problems. Like, we want to believe, and this is what everybody wants to say, and even Carpathy says, you know, everybody keeps saying that 2025 is the year of the agents. I don't even think it's the decade of agents, and he says that. I think we're two to three decades away from this really working. And I think we're going to see more and more problems cropping up with these, and I'm going to do a video on this tomorrow. Um, more and more problems cropping up with these, then we're going to see solutions. Now, I'm not against agents, but they've got to be checked. We're using agents for a handful of different things for data matching where it's really good at, but we keep really really tight boundaries on that. And one of the biggest things we definitely don't do is it stays local on our servers. It does not leave. It's not going out to chat GPT. It's not going to Google Gemini. None of that. It stays all the data staying on our servers and we're using open source models. And, and that's where he, he talks about here this, right? He says that building autonomous software is not an Iron Man robot. It flashy demos autonomous agents and AGI of 2027. He says that's all crap. And what I'm getting over and over again is a lot of people talking about these flashy demos. They're talking about the robots that are going to take over the humans. And they're talking about this, you know, um, apocalyptic AGI 2027 document that's out there that I haven't even actually given the time of day because it's so far off. What he is saying is we need to build Iron Man suits with partial autonomy products with custom GUIs to make this easier. And I think we're actually further away from these GUIs and these UI UX than, than even he necessarily wanted to admit. The faster generation to the faster verification loop, right? Should be generate, give it back to you. One of the best things I love about it is when I'm coding, I love that it can finish my sentence for me well. Like that's fantastic. It makes me write really fast. I write code really fast now, right? But that autonomy slider that he talks about here, because the other part about the autonomy slider is the more senior the developers are, the better this, these tools seem to work because they know how they work. Tony Stark didn't, isn't some dude just off the street. He built the suit, right? And that's why I think this analogy is like spot on. And I think more so than even he did. So he goes through this example. And this is one of the things that just cracks me up because he's like, hey, cool. Could it get a very easy project running locally? Yes. Could it solve all the rest of these problems? No, not even close. And I think, again, this all of these come back to it, to those, those five problems that we were talking about. But even in this t running locally part, I think that part even, that was great. And it worked in his case because it was a simple MVP that he wrote from scratch. I want it to take code that's 20 years old, written on .NET 4.7 or 4.6, been running out there for a decade, and now go give that thing to an LLM and see what the heck it does with it. Because I can guarantee you it's going to crash and burn. So like that's my point, whereas it, even a mid-level level developer could take that and write it into .NET 8, right? These are the things that I think is a long ways. Could it, could it build some, you know, again, that even goes back to his own point about flashy demos, right? This, these flashy demos of the autonomous agents. That, that's where I think even he um, is getting a little wrong because he's talking about where his flashy demo that he built of this MVP product like, hey, it was great that it did it for him. Okay, cool. I'm glad I had fun. And I and look, guys, I think vibe coding is great. I think it's fun. I think it's great for if you want to build a demo, if you want to build an MVP, if you want to build some boilerplate code, knock yourself out, vibe code away. But these guys who keep plugging my channel, telling me that they're going to vibe code the next OS and the next Sentinel Bean, <laughs> I just, I just, it's funny. Like, it's, it's just really funny. Um, 
and so this is where he's talking about this and 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 this is like his summary slide here and i and again i agree with a lot of this i think that this point about web 3.0 where he's saying it's going to infiltrate into 2.0 and, and 1.0 i agree with that I think this is a long ways off. I do think we're in the 1960s. I totally agree with that. But remember, the 1960s was 20, it was, um, excuse me, 60 some years ago, right? And where I'm not saying that it might take 60 years, I definitely think we're 30 to 40 years away from it making humans actually build software with English. I, I think we're a long ways from that. Because a lot of times, half the time, by the time I've been done writing a prompt, I would have been faster to just use those autonomous tools to write the code faster. Right. And that's kind of the one place where I think he's missing this a little bit. I think this generation loop and I think this AI to human, uh, the full gener generation uh, verification flow, I think is best used to build strong developer tools to help make developers faster at the writing code. But as even he stated, being a developer is one like writing the code is one very small portion of being a developer. There's a ton more to being a developer. And this is only if you're writing the brand new Greenfield application, which is probably like 10% of what developers get to write, if that. Developers don't get to write all brand new code. They spend a ton of time working on older code. So do I think he's right? Yes. Do I think that what we need to be looking at is Iron Man in the Iron Man suit? Absolutely. I totally agree with this. And I think that Carpathy really obviously has you know a lot to give us because this is where I think the state of what we are at. And this is why I think software developer jobs are going to explode. People come at me all the time and they're like, AI is stealing all the jobs. AI hasn't stolen any jobs. That's bull crap. We haven't seen any proof of that. You go look at layoff.fyi of all the jobs that have been taken this year. It's because Intel has been too bloated and they're the top of the list. They're almost a third of the layoffs this year was from Intel. Microsoft, the next one, bloated up like crazy and they know it. So they're trimming off and voting people off the island. IBM trimmed a bunch. Most of them weren't even development. And even the one were in development, they hired back into most of the other departments. We're not seeing developer jobs particularly. Some of the other industries are going to be hit by this. I do think there will be some trimming of some of those, but I think all, as we've seen history repeat itself over and over again, we're gonna see them land into other better jobs. I think AI is going to end up bringing more jobs. What's hit more jobs right now is interest rates have been at the highest rate they've been at for the longest time. I know they've been higher. Everybody comes at me and be like, in the 60s, they were nice. We have not seen in the last 30 years since technology has really been strong and really been a, a sector, right? Pre, uh, you know, pre 30 years ago, technology wasn't really a portion of the stock market. Now it's such a large portion, it mostly drives the stock market, right? And, and so because of that, we've since that in the 30 years, we have not seen interest rates this high this long. That's the part. Have we seen a couple of spikes? Yes, but it's come back down. The feds need to cut rates. As soon as they do, within a quarter, we're gonna see software development jobs come back. The tax codes that have been changed to make it so that CapEx spending can't be written off entirely is another big hit that we're seeing against corporates. These are the things that are hitting jobs. It's not AI. AI is going to end up bringing more software and IT development jobs than we've ever seen before. Because as we start to see these new tools get into the hands of developers, developers are gonna develop more more, not less. And as they develop more, companies are going to be hungrier for it. They're going to continue to want to. Again, we're seeing you know, IBM's reporting that only 16% of all AI projects right now have made it to production. What about that other 84%? They're still sitting on a cutting room floor somewhere. Somebody still wants those. They just don't have the money spent on it because money is so expensive right now. So that's where we're at right now. That is the current state of AI. You know, here at Startup Hack, we love to train software developers as well as to build custom software solutions for companies. So reach out because we'd love to help. Check out startuphack.com slash Spencer and here's some great information about some of our awesome services. Hi, my name is Spencer Thomason and I'm a fractional CTO. With over a decade of executive leadership and a solid 25 years in software development, I've mastered the art of transforming technology teams and products. So what is a fractional CTO? This is where you can contract someone like myself to come into your organization and get the benefits of a seasoned CTO without having to employ me full time. In today's fast paced world, efficiency, security and product scaling aren't just goals, they're necessities. My passion is building impactful products and enhancing organizational efficiencies through technology. 
From startups to small businesses, my approach leverages lean methodologies to not just meet but exceed your strategic goals, whether it's through executive mentoring, cloud system architecture, or launching a minimum viable product swiftly, my aim is to make a significant impact right from the start. Recognized in the Arizona startup ecosystem, my journey has been about creating value and fostering innovation. I have led technology for companies like GoDaddy, SRP, and Wells Fargo and turned challenges into milestones. I've taken this learning and launched seven of my own brands, and now I want to help you. So if you're looking for a fractional CTO who brings a wealth of experience, strategic vision, and a proven track record, let's connect. Together we can build technology that not only drives your business forward, but also makes a difference. Technology leadership redefined to fit your needs. So reach out today.